This afternoon I want to share with you under the topic of God's last name. And I know that's a strange sounding topic, but I think when we, when we have completed the study, you'll understand why I have given it this strange title. First of all, most of us know that in the Bible you will find different names used by God, especially in the Old Testament. I mean, some that come to mind are, of course, Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, can you think of another one? I am. I am. Jehovah. Jehovah. We said that one. Anybody knows any other? Yahshua. Yahshua. I think that's... that's, that's the, the name that was used for Jesus, yes. But can you think of another Old Testament name? All right, he's called the Ancient of Days in Daniel, yes. And he's also called El Shaddai. God of Gods. He's called God of Gods. He's called Adonai. And another word that is used to, to, to refer to God is Elohim. Now, El Shaddai means the Almighty. Adonai means Lord. Yahweh refers to the self-existent one. Yahweh or Jehovah. And every name that is used is brings to our mind a different aspect of God's nature or God's character. Now this is a, a peculiar aspect of names in the Bible. Maybe not so peculiar. Maybe we are the ones who are peculiar because today we give our children names Kimia, Conroy, and we don't have a clue what these names mean, but we know they sound nice. But in the Bible, names were chosen because they were intended to convey an idea. And every time God uses a different name in the Bible or somebody refers to God in a different way, it's because God is trying to bring out some different aspect of his nature or his character or somebody has discovered something new about God. For example, when, when Abraham was about to kill his son and God provided the, the ram, Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, which means what? God, my provider. And um, when, 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 when Moses led the Israelites into battle against the Amalekites and they conquered through the power of God, Moses called the place Jehovah Nissi, the Lord my banner or the Lord my ensign, the flag that you take into battle. Another name that he's called is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, God says to Abraham, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. El Shaddai means the Almighty One. So many times the name that God uses depends upon the particular revelation of himself that he wants to give. And many times people who had a relationship with God, they gave God a peculiar name depending upon what they had discovered about his character. When Daniel refers to him as the Ancient of Days, what aspect of God do you think he's focusing on? A Spanish friend of mine down in Mexico wrote a book about the names of Jesus Christ. He came up with over 3,000 names of Christ. Wow. Like the light of the world and the bread of life and so on. And that is, that is a tremendous discovery because, you see, are there 3,000 different aspects to Christ's character? Yeah. Amazing. You know, um, and it would be interesting to take all those names and see what does each name mean to me in my personal experience? I think we would have a wonderful experience just by going through a, an exploration like that. But anyway, the point I want to make at the beginning is that God uses names to represent some different aspects of his character. And this is very much the way it is in the Bible. Now, what is interesting is that today, and I think it was so in Bible times too, most people have two names, at least two. Some people have five or six, but most people have at least two names. It's interesting that in our culture, we have the family name last. And we have the personal name first. So my name is David Clayton. But uh, I, I'm sure we are aware that in, in, in other parts of the world, it's not like this. Like in Africa, in the, in the East, in Europe, I've found that they call the last name first. In, in Europe, I would be Clayton David. In Africa, I am Clayton David. When I, go to Africa, people, when I went to Africa, people got a bit confused. They kept calling me Clayton. Even close friends called me Clayton because they thought it was my personal name. They didn't realize it was my family name. Even though I have a friend in Africa whose name is Mafo Chinyemba. 
but I'm not sure. It could be Chin Yamba Mafo. I'm not sure which one comes first and last, and I get confused every time I'm to write to him. I don't know whether to say Dear Mafo or Dear Chin Yamba because I got mixed up, because their, their standard is different than ours. Now, each of these names, each of the names that we use has a different implication. Which of these names did I get first? Was it Clayton or was it David? Clayton. Clayton. How did I get that name? From your daddy. I was born with it. I had no choice about that name. From the moment I, was, I came into that bloodstream, that family line, my name was Clayton. And when you hear the name Clayton, it tells you certain things about me. It tells you, for example, that I belong to a family of people who have this kind of hair, this skin color, these big noses. It tells you certain things about us because these are things that are common to my family. The name Clayton describes aspects of my nature, things I was born with, and things that were inevitably mine from the moment I was conceived. Clayton refers to my heritage, my, heritage, my natural heritage, things that are mine by nature. But when I, my, my first name, the name that was given to me by my father was the name David. And I think if you understand that my father was an Adventist minister, you kind of get an idea of the way his mind was working. What do you think he was thinking when he named me David? He had a hope. I don't know if he has been disappointed, but he had a hope. He was hoping that as I grew up and as I began to develop, somehow my character would be similar to the character of the David in the Bible. And so he gave me that name with that hope. And you find that's the way it is in the Bible. When Jacob was born, uh, before he was born, the strangest thing happened. He was twins. His brother came out, and while he was still in the belly, he pushed out his hand out of his mother's womb and held on to his brother's foot. The strangest thing that you could imagine. And they said, this is a sign. This is a sign. This boy is going to take away what belongs to his brother. And so they named him Jacob, the supplanter, the one who takes what belongs to another. So his name signified the character that they saw would develop in him as he grew up. So there's a distinct difference between first names and last names. In fact, let me put it the, the, the right way around. I think that the people in Europe and Africa have it right. They put the family name first because that's the one you get first, right? Before you are even born, you have that name. But the name you are given afterwards expresses a hope as to the kind of character that you will develop. Something that they see in you that makes you know, makes them know what you will become. So it's right to put the family name first, and that's, that's the protocol I'm going to be using in this presentation. The first name, the family name. The last name, the name that describes your character. Yes, Down in brother. Mexico, uh, a man carries his mother's last name, right? Uh, John Rodriguez Medina. His mother's last name before she married was Medina. Okay. If you don't know his mother's last name, you can't find his name in her telephone book. Right, and that, that complicates it even more. We're going to keep it simple. We're not going to use the Mexican <laughs> idea at all. All right. If we look at Jesus, let me ask you a question straight off, a little question to, to stimulate our thinking. Jesus, what was his first name or his family name? Elohim. All right, that's close enough. That's close enough. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4. Well, uh, I wasn't thinking of Jesus as the son of Mary and Joseph, really. Chapter 4. And look at verse, uh, chapter 1, chapter 1, I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 4. Referring to Jesus, here's what it says. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained what? A more excellent name than they. And what this name is we find in verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So we find that Jesus' 
family name. In other words, the, the name that describes his nature is, is, is the name God. This is the name that he had when he was born. The Bible says he obtained this name how? By inheritance. By inheritance he obtained a more excellent name than the angels. The angels could never have the name God by inheritance because that was not their nature. But as I obtained the name Clayton when I was born, Jesus obtained the name God by inheritance. So his family name is God. But what can you tell me about Jesus' personal name? What would you say is his personal name? Jesus. Jesus. And what does that mean? In, in Matthew 1 and verse 21, the angel said to Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus. What? For he shall save his people from their sins. This name signified what Christ would do, what work he would do during his lifetime. It was not the name he received at birth. It was not to do with his nature, but to do with his work. And, and, and you can think of the word Christ as well, another name of Jesus. In fact, the Bible tells us that he's, he has a new name. And I'm going to talk about that a little later on. But he has a new name. So he has several names. But it's interesting that this new name of Christ is going to be written upon a certain group of people. So the point I'm really making, I'm, trying, I'm going to great lengths to establish, is that there's a difference between the first and the last names. And basically, from what I've seen in the Bible, the first name refers to, or the family name refers to what you receive at birth. It's, it's, it's nature. It's, it, it's something you have no choice about. But nature is different from character. And that's a critical thing to understand. You know, as we have been talking about righteousness in Christ, many people have been asking the question, what are you, why are you not talking about character development? Now, you know, there's something about Seventh-day Adventists that is interesting. And, and all of this that I've been studying has made me look at Adventism like I've never looked at it before, and I've seen so many things that have come out. You know, Adventists started out as a people who recognized that God has a plan for his people in the last days. And this plan involves character development. Adventists became so engrossed in the idea of character development that they made it all embracing. They have made character development so important that they have almost totally cast out the concept of the new birth. They have come to the place where many Adventists believe you cannot be saved without a perfect character. God helped the thief on the cross. They believe that the basis of salvation is a perfect character. Now, I'm not going to say too much about that because I'm going to come back to it. But I want you to see that there is a difference between having a certain kind of nature and having a certain kind of character. God has both a first name and a last name. And we'll see how that applies to God's people. Go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Chapter 14. It says, And I looked, in verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now I'm sure you have read through this passage before, and if you read from verse 1 to verse 5, it's a detailed description of this group of people. They are singing a song that no man can sing except them. They, 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 they are virgins, it says, for they are not defiled with women. They are without fault before the throne of God, certain peculiar characteristics of these people. And one of those characteristics is that they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. Now I'll ask a very simple question, just to keep your, just to keep your mind on, 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 on the path. I used to be a school teacher, and I learned that if you want to keep children interested, you have to ask questions. So sometimes I use it on adults. Forgive me. <laughs> but I like to keep your attention, because... If you just talk and talk, some of the points miss you. But when you are asked a question, you have to think about the issue. So I'm asking the question, is this God's first name or God's last name that they have in their foreheads? Is this God's 
family name or is it the name referring to God's character that is in the forest of this 144,000? Character. character. We all agree on that. So it's not God's family name which would be in this case his first name. It would be his last name which refers to character. And we know this is so. Yes, my brother. All right. I think, that's, I think that's what this is. I'm sure that that is involved. I'm sure. That may be, that may be, yeah, that may be just putting a blanket on it that says everything. But we want to go into it in a little more detail. Because the point is, every Christian does not have this name written on their forehead. Not every Christian has this name. If every Christian had this name written on their forehead, what is the point of pointing to it as a peculiar mark of the 144,000? This is a peculiar mark of the 144,000. Yet they are not the only people who will be saved. Many others will be saved. So why is it pointed out that these are special in that they have the Father's name in their forehead? It is because whatever this signifies, other Christians in general do not have this mark. So this name of the Father, whatever it is, is not something that is common to all Christians. Let me show you what is common to all Christians. Uh, we, we'll come back to Revelation here. But just look at Second Peter 1. And verse 4. See what it says here. Whereby are given, to, given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. So the divine nature refers to the nature of God. And nature is what you inherit when you are born. So these, every Christian has to have the first name of God or God's family name. We're all children of God. Every Christian is a child of God because you have received the divine nature. So we have God's first name. We're all Christians. We're all children of God. We have that that was ours even before we were born. All we had to do to receive it was to be born. I mean born again. So as soon as you are born again, that name is yours automatically. You receive the divine nature. But the first name, the character, is a different thing. Now, it's interesting because when you look you find that these 144,000 have certain characteristics that other Christians don't have. Now many Christians will be saved who were defiled with women, is that right? And for the little children I want you to understand when the Bible talks about women, when Revelation speaks about women, it is talking about religious bodies. So when it says that the 144,000 are not defiled with women, it means that they are not defiled with religious bodies. These are Christians who have a unique relationship with Christ. They are not defiled with Yes, my brother. I don't want to back up too far here, but it seems like you said two different things. I'm trying to figure out which one it is. Does the first name represent his character or his last name represent his character? I, I'm using the, the, the European protocol. And in, in Europe, the first name represents the nature, the thing you are born with. That's the family name. That's the family name. So I'm, using, I'm following that, that protocol. So when I say first name, I, I mean the family name, the nature that you receive. Every Christian receives God's nature. And if you don't have that nature, you cannot be saved. But when do you become a member of the family? Is it when your character develops or when you are born? When you are born. My child at one day old is a Clayton. Absolutely. You could almost say before he was born, at one day, at one minute old, he's a Clayton. He has no option. What makes him a member of the family is the fact that he was born from my bloodline. My nature is in him and he is my son. That's what it means to be born into the kingdom of God. Therefore, Catholics are going to be saved. I don't mean a lot, but there are some Catholics who will be saved, right? We all believe that. There are people who are going to be born, who were defiled with, who were going to be saved, who were defiled with women. There are Christians who are going to be saved who had fault. There are Christians who are going to be saved who never had the Father's name written in their foreheads. There are Christians who are going to be saved who could not sing the song of the 144,000. 
but they belong to the family because they have the nature. What qualifies you for salvation is having the divine nature, not having the divine character. Now that's very important. If, if you needed to have the divine character to be saved, like I said, God helped the thief on the cross. He was born again, but how long did he have to develop character? One day. One day. And he had one day hanging in the sun to develop character. I tell you. Anyway, we won't go into that. Rahab the prostitute is saved. And she was saved. She demonstrated her loyalty to God by telling a lie. She broke the law to demonstrate her loyalty to God. How much did she understand about character development? But she was born because she demonstrated faith in God. She's saved by faith. Her character to some extent. But would you say, let me, let me put it another way then. You know, it, my child is a member of my family at one day old. But you know, Abraham has four children. And the youngest one is? Benjamin. Benjamin. Now Benjamin is very much a Hirschberger. You can't mistake it. He looks like the Hirschberger family. He has certain characteristics that make him very much a Hirschberger. But if, if Abraham needs somebody to represent the family... Would he choose Benjamin? Maybe. You think maybe? Well, I'm sure Abraham might not agree. <laughs> because if you're looking for somebody to represent your family, you need somebody who understands, who, who is more than just born with a certain nature. He must have developed a character where he is fit to represent the family. He must have understanding and maturity before you would call upon him to represent the family. In, in this sense, countries choose ambassadors based upon their understanding of the principles of the country and their ability to represent the country. Governments, churches, families do the same thing. Character development is not a qualification for salvation, but it's a requirement for representing the family. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, we have to make this distinction very clear. One of the, 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 the strongest assaults I have had in the last three years is from Christians who tell me I'm not emphasizing character development. And they think that because I'm not emphasizing character development, I'm robbing people of their salvation. Because in their thinking, character development is what salvation is about. And you know what happens? Every day that they get up out of their beds, they recognize I am not perfect. So how much do you think they're assured of their salvation? Zero assurance. They never ever can say that I have salvation. In fact, they tell you we are taught not to say I am saved. And so if you say I, I am saved or I have salvation, they will accuse you of being a false teacher. So you live your life in perpetual fear and you never can feel one day that if Jesus came today I'd be ready because every day it is impressed on your mind, I am not yet perfect, and you think that is the qualification for perfection, uh, for salvation. And so you live in a desperate hope that maybe someday before you die, you just might make it. But you wonder when, because it seems that you are no closer to the mark after 50 years. And your hope is that one moment before you die, you just might be able to say, Lord, please forgive me, and then die happily. And so you die in a state of forgiveness. But realistically, following that road, there is no hope that you're ever going to make it. And so many of our people live in a state where they have no assurance of salvation. They're in constant fear and they're under constant pressure because they think that character perfection is the qualification for salvation. And it is not. The Bible abundantly, abundantly makes this clear. If it, 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 it's, it's evident just from the fact that a one, one minute old Christian, a true Christian, somebody who gives his life to Christ this minute and dies the next, will be in the kingdom. That alone makes it clear. But at the same time, we cannot deny that God has a plan to perfect people on this earth before Jesus comes again. So we, we must understand the reason for this. And we must understand that that reason is not so that they might be saved. There's another reason behind it. Now, let's see if we can understand 
what is this process of perfection of character? What is involved in it and why is it necessary? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. I'd like us to read verses 8 and 9. Now this again is speaking of Jesus. And it says, Though he were a son, though he already had God's first name, yet learned he obedience. What? Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now that's strikingly interesting because I know that Jesus never committed a single sin from the day he was born. In fact, not just then. Since eternity began until eternity ends, Jesus never ever committed a single sin nor ever had the intention of committing sin. Whether he was a baby on his mother's bosom or a man dying on the cross, he never committed sin. And yet the Bible says he was made perfect so that teaches us something it tells us that even though a person may be without fault there is still some process of development may, uh, necessary it tells me that perfection does not always mean perfection you can be perfect and then need to be perfect because Jesus I believe well, I'm not going to get into the argument about the nature of Christ and all the rest of it, but I believe Jesus was born morally perfect. Not physically. Physically, he was like me and you, right? He was born with a degenerate body, with the weaknesses and the tendencies of the degenerate flesh. But I think his mind was the mind of the Son of God. Somebody in heaven was Michael. And one day, a miracle took place. How? We don't know. We can't ask. But this glorious Michael with all the power and the glory of God, suddenly he was no longer there. And what remained of him was a little speck of life in a woman's belly growing. In that speck of life, there were no memories of who he was. There was no omnipresence, no omnipotence, no omniscience. He was just a human fetus inside a woman's belly. But when that fetus was born with all the limitations of the body that was prepared for him, yet in that mind was the infinite purity of the Son of God. So he was born morally perfect, even though his flesh was not. But the point I'm making is that the fact that he was born perfect did not remove the necessity of him being made perfect. So we need to understand those two concepts of perfection. Yes. You said he was born, born again. Yeah. All right. We could say that. After this presentation, if you want to discuss it, I'll, I will share with you why I'm not even willing to say that. Okay. But I'm not going to say it here because it's going to drag us off course. Is that going to drag us off course, Tony? To simplify this, when you are born again, you become a partaker of the divine nature immediately. Jesus was divine before he was ever born on earth. I'm not even going to comment until after the presentation. You might be, I might agree with you or I might not, but I won't comment. Because I don't want our minds to be distracted from where we are here now. Now, have you ever seen a perfect apple or close to perfect? Yeah, apple. Was it ripe or green? It was red. Have you ever seen a perfect green apple? Good. All right, in other words, when you talk about perfection, we're not referring to maturity. Necessarily, not necessarily referring to maturity. I've seen a perfect green apple or a perfect green uh, orange. I've never seen a green orange so perfectly round, with such a beautiful color, so clean, and so looking like it belonged in paradise. But what is the purpose for which an orange was created? Nutrition. To be eaten. Or an apple, it was created to be eaten. An apple or orange may be ever so perfect, but it is not mature. It is not mature until it is ready to fulfill the purpose for which it was created. That is a time when it is really perfect in the absolute sense. 
Therefore, you know, Ellen White makes a statement that at every stage of development, the Christian may be perfect. The newborn Christian, the thief on the cross, was perfect. Not perfect in maturity, but he was perfect in nature. Because the nature that he received was the very nature of God. And there's no imperfection in God. Amen. He was perfect in his nature. Now, perfection in maturity depends upon acquiring knowledge. There are some people in the Sunday churches who are not keeping the Sabbath. Their knowledge is not perfect. But what about their nature? What about their relationship to God? Yeah. If it is right, they are effectively perfect. But not perfect in character or in maturity. There's room for development as they acquire more knowledge. But they are ready to be saved if Jesus should come because they are in a state where their life is linked to the life of Christ. If I can put it another way. There's only one kind of perfection that God requires in order to save us. And it is perfection in surrender. Let me give you an illustration of this that I, I have used and I have loved. You know, I have a little girl. Let's say the size of Benjamin. Let me use Benjamin again. He's one of the small children inside here. Or one of those others over there, but I don't know their names. But you have a little child, two or three years old, maybe four years old. And, and Abraham is a farmer, and he's farming. He's planting his crops. You know, and Benjamin notices that every day he's there pulling up some things out of the ground. He's pulling up the weeds, right? One day daddy's gone. He's gone to work, and Benjamin decides he's going to give daddy a nice surprise. And you know what he does? He goes into daddy's garden and he pulls up all the good plants. Daddy comes back and he's aghast. His crop is decimated. Who did this? And Benjamin comes running out. Daddy, daddy, look. Look how I helped you. What does he do? I tell you. If you're a fool, you get mad with a child and you want to spank him. But if you're a wise parent, you recognize that his action is wrong. But his heart is right. You say, thank you so much, son. But let me show you the good ones and the bad ones. So that next time, he does the job right. This child does not need schooling. His heart is right. What he needs is education. If you can understand this, you can understand why a one-day-old Christian is fit to be saved. Because his heart belongs to God. He's ready to do whatever he knows God wants him to do. That's all God requires of us, a heart that says, not I, but you. Education is not the issue. It is a heart that is controlled by the Spirit of God. Yes, my Many times the older church members pick on newly baptized people because they haven't perfected character yet. To me, that's like kicking a baby that hasn't learned to walk yet. Thank you. Thank you. And that's exactly what, what, <laughs> what happens in many cases. I mean, and it's because we have come to confuse education with salvation. We have come to think if you don't, if you don't do things exactly the way I do it. You know, I went, I went to Poland, and it happened in Africa too. You know, the ladies asked me, should a Christian cover her hair, a Christian woman? Like I said last night, you know, I kind of, I didn't want to tell them yes or no. I went to the Bible, and I tried to explain the principle that Paul was trying to, 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 to deal with. One sister stood up and said, no brother, no brother. We want to hear if we should or should not do it. We're all Christians. We must all do the same things. I said, you want to be clones. And you want me to be the clone master. I said, no, I'm not going to tell you. And, and they, they got a little bit upset because they want me to tell, tell all the women to cover their hairs. And then everybody would cover their hair, right? And we'd all look the same like a set of... Marionettes and puppets, all walking in order because we look exactly the same. And what about the state of our hearts? Can't tell. You can't tell. And very often, you know, people, people mistake uniformity for unity. The Bible talks about the unity of the spirit. But people think the uniformity of the spirit. But you know, the soldiers wear the same uniform and they march in order, but they might hate each other. Looking alike doesn't mean that you're alike. The unity of the spirit works from the inside. Brings out of us what God wants to see. What I'm saying is that education in right and wrong. Education is a lesser part of the thing. Education is necessary, yes, and God educates us. Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, what will he do? 
guide you into all truth. Which comes first, truth or the spirit? The spirit comes first. Not until a person is born again of the spirit is he really qualified to understand and to receive truth. You are born first, then you are educated. But you notice in, 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 in our church, they educate you first and they make sure you understand the 27 fundamentals before they will baptize you. I suppose there was a reason why they started out this way, but I tell you it has become extended and misused to the extent where people think that understanding 27 or 28 it is now, 28 doctrines is a qualification to walk on the streets of gold. And that is sad. That is sad. I, I read a story once, and it, those of you who have, have read a book by an Adventist missionary named Elwin Martin. It's called I Saw God's Hand. Have you ever read that book, anybody? I know the Standish has uh, reprinted that book, but the first time I read it, I was greatly blessed. But you know, this man was a missionary in the South Seas. And he told about working with a group of tribesmen. And he met a little man, a little man among these tribes people. You know, when, when the missionaries arrived at this village of naked people, savages, you know, those headhunters used to take off people's head and shrink them. He arrived among these savage people, and when he took out his Bible, a little man covered with pigs, pig, pig grease, naked, right down to, to his big toe, began to jump up and down and say, It's the truth, my people, it's the truth. Listen to him. Then he sat down, and the man was continued talking. He jumped up again. It's true, my people, it's true. Listen to him. After that happened a few times, he said to the little man, Have you heard this message before? The man said, No. Have you seen me before? No. So how do you know it's true? And the man told a story. You know, before they went into this village, they started praying for the village. And the man said one night he was in his hut and he saw a bright light. And he saw a bright shining man standing in the hut. And the man told him to go and kill all his pigs. He had about 30 something pigs. And in that culture, the only thing that is more valuable than your pig is your wife. In actual fact, they use pigs to buy wives. So when he went on, when he was to kill his pigs now, he'd have been a madman. But he was so, it was so wonderful to see this bright shining visitor. He went on the next day, killed all his pigs. Everybody in the village said he was mad. But they ate pig meat for breakfast, lunch and dinner for several days. And the man said if he would do this, he would come back again on a certain day so he went back and the long and short of it is that the man told him to build a house out in the jungle and he would come and see him there and he went and built his house out there the man said he was to number seven days and then on the seventh day he was to go and stay in that hut and the man would be with him all day in any way the whole story is that through this experience this, this little man learned about health reform about the sabbath and the last time that this person appeared to him he says go back to the village you will see a man there with a black book. Everything he tells you is true. When he went back to the village, he saw the missionary sitting there telling the story. So that's why he was jumping up and saying, It's true, my people, it's true. Listen to it, it's true. So, anyway, the, the, the story is that the missionary had to leave and go back to his base for two weeks. When he was about to leave, this little man came to him and said, I would like to be baptized. Can you baptize me? This man was a church man. He said, well, you need a little more teaching. You need a little more instruction. He said, I will, um, I'm going back to, to um, our, our mission station, and I will leave somebody here to instruct you some more. And when I come back, I will baptize you. He went away to the mission station. When he came back, the man was dead. The little man, his name was Donnie. He was dead. He died in the interim. Now, I don't think that means that he's lost, but I think it's such a statement that God can send an angel to teach a man the, some, some very critical things. An angel can come and teach a man and bring him to the place where he, he requests baptism. And you, because of your teaching and the system you are in, say, I cannot baptize you till you are proper, properly indoctrinated. We come to believe that indoctrination is a qualification for salvation. And it is wrong, wrong, wrong. And so, as I said, as I've been talking about righteousness in Christ and what it means to be born again, which is a foundational thing, People have been very strongly opposed to it because they say, what about character development? 
And so this evening I knew I had to talk about God's last name because I do believe in character development. But we must put it in its right place. God has a plan. And that plan involves a kind of character development that is wonderful. If you are prepared to pass through what is necessary. But just remember that for the old people like Sister Melba and me, <laughs> if we don't reach that place and we happen to die today, you're not going to take away salvation from us just because we might not have reached that place of character development. Don't make that the criterion for salvation. Otherwise, we're all lost. And only the 144,000 are going to, be, to make it. But we are grateful to God that, that is, the, the perfection of the 144,000 is not so that God can save them. It's because God wants to show the world something. And he's going to do it. And when I understand that, I think, boy, I really would like to be a part of that group. But like I said, having this wrong perspective makes us think of, we can never be sure that we are saved. Secondly, it makes us focus on what man must do, instead of on what God has done. Because we say, God has saved you, God has started the work, now you must finish it. What a pitiful way of looking at salvation, and that's how many people see it. God started it, he gave you a start. You go finish, and if you don't finish, woe be unto you. It makes us downplay the new birth experience, because we think that alone is not enough to save. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 7. Go back to Revelation 7 here now. And I want to read something here in verse 14. Revelation 7. Now regardless of how you interpret the rest of the chapter, I know in verse 14 we all agree that this verse is speaking of the one for the 4,000. In, in, in the first four verses, John saw the one for the 4,000 being sealed. Now in verse 14... In fact, in verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now does anybody have a version other than the King James Version? Okay, what does it say in your version when it says, these are, the, these are they that came out of, the, uh, out of great tribulation? And it says? It says, um, these are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. Right, right. You're using a little word here that is not in the King James, and you just went over it pretty fast. The. 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 Now, I, I did some research on this, and I discovered that the word the is in the original text from which the King James Version is translated. Why it isn't in the, in the translation itself, maybe an oversight or maybe they thought it wasn't necessary. But what the verse actually says is that these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. It's not just any tribulation. It's not just any trouble like your, neighbor's, your neighbor lets go his goat in your garden. Or the children break your window with a stone and you say, oh what tribulation Christians have to go through. No, this is the great tribulation. It is something of such immense proportions. It has the definite article. There has never been a tribulation in the history of the planet that compares with this experience, Brother Abraham. Daniel 12. Daniel 12. 24. Yes, the, 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 the time of trouble such as never was. Now, the Bible does not just say that they have come out of this great tribulation. But during that process, they have, something has happened to them. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, you know, every Christian receives a robe. Because in Matthew 22, it tells us in that parable that if you go to the wedding supper without that robe, the king will command that you be bound hand, in, hand and foot and cast into outer darkness. Jesus says to Laodicea, I counsel thee to buy of me what? Gold tried in the fire and white raiment that you may be clothed. Every Christian 
is covered to some extent with this white garment, but the 144,000 of them it is said that they have gone through a process whereby their robes have been whitened. They have been wearing the robes while they were being whitened. Now it's one thing to throw your clothes in the washing machine and let them wash, but throw yourself in there with the clothes and you'll know that you have been through great tribulation. You normally don't put your clothes in the washing machine with you inside. And if you do, you'll know that you have been thoroughly tribulationized. These people have been washed. Their robes have been washed in this great tribulation and made white. And you know, I was thinking about it and wondering what does it imply. And I became a little bit scared because I got a glimpse of what it is going to be like. Christians have been burned alive by the droves, thrown to wild beasts, persecuted beyond description. The Bible says what is coming is worse. It is the great tribulation. Now, why does God do this? Why does God allow this to happen to his people whom he loves? Well, turn with me to a few verses here. Let's start with James 1 and verse 12. James 1 and verse 12. Then we're going to step back to Hebrews. It says in verse 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. What this verse tells me is that one of the means that God has of purifying us, of perfecting us, of making us better, is by allowing us to pass through temptation. But in Hebrews chapter 12, it, said, it says it even more perfectly. Go to chapter 12 of Hebrews, just one book earlier. It says in verse 11, Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peace of the fruit of righteousness in them which are exercised thereby. What this says is that when you are being beaten, you don't like it. I suppose this generation of, of young people don't understand what this means, but I think... Those of you who are maybe over 30 or 40 can remember a little bit about it, right? Those were the days when they still used to spank in America. It still goes on in Jamaica. But, you know, do you recognize that the, the greatest lessons that you have ever learned in your life were those that you learned through great difficulty? Now, most people get up at the beginning of each year and they make resolutions. How many do they keep? Well, most of them keep zero. Even those with the strongest wills, they don't change. I watch my children grow up and I, say, I taught them so many things and I counsel them and I see them grow up and make the same mistakes that I talk to them so hard about. And sometimes I've sat down and I, I've looked at them and I said, boy, people don't learn except by experience. The most indelibly engraved lessons I ever learned were learned in difficulty. I tried to change myself many times. The only time my character ever made a big step was when I was in bad trouble. When I was a boy. I'm ashamed to tell it, but that is what I was, not what I am. I was going to high school, just started, a little boy. I started following my friends to the store and picking up things and putting in my pocket. They went there and they picked up rings. I didn't need a ring. They picked up little things. I just started following them, pushing it in my pocket. And I didn't get caught. So one day I went into the, into the supermarket and I loaded my pockets. <laughs> I stuffed things in my shirt. And there was a girl watching me who worked there. Man, and when she came and grabbed me. Oh boy, I remember the shame to this day. Because those people knew my uncle. And when they brought me before the, 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 the owners, oh, I wish the ground could open and swallow me up. I took out what little money I had from my mother in my pocket and I paid for what I could and they took back the rest of the goods. 
to this day, I have never put my foot back inside that supermarket, even though it is on the other side of the island. But as long as I live there, I've never gone back there. To this day, if I go into Walmart, as a man 55 years old, if I go into Walmart or Staples, I keep my hands like this. <laughs> I make sure nobody ever thinks I'm putting anything in my pocket. I learned a lesson that day that changed one aspect of my character for eternity. And it happened through very trying circumstances. I remember one time I told a lie. I, I interfered with my brother's things. And my brother would not leave me alone. He kept harassing me until he went to my father. And I, I, to this day, I respect the way my father did things. And finally, you know, my father realized it was an issue. He called up the whole family. My mother, my father, my five brothers, and I think one sister was born at the time, or maybe two. And they put me in the middle. <laughs> and Daddy said, David, did you take all his things? I said, no, Daddy. He said, honesty, and he gave me a lecture on honesty, and he gave me a lecture on what it means to have the good, the right principles. Then he said again, David, did you take, take all his things? No, Daddy. He stopped and he talked a little bit and he talked a little bit. He talked a little bit. He said, David, did you take all, that, all his things? No, Daddy. Finally, he said, can I believe you? Yes, Daddy. Then he asked the question that I could not answer. He said, can Jesus believe you? Because I grew us up in such a way, with such a fear of God, I could not answer. I could not say Jesus believes me. And my father said, I'm so disappointed. And he gave me a lecture. In my mind, I'm saying, just beat me and be done. Just beat me and be done. I could not take the lecturing. I was so ashamed. But, you know, he didn't, he didn't really give me much of a spanking. He just sent me for the strap and gave me four little taps in my hand. I was so relieved. I tell you, that will live in my mind till the day I die. It did something. It, 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 it. These things made changes in my, in my lifestyle. Permanent changes. You think somebody comes and says, you must be honest, David. You think he could have done anything to me? My parents told me this. I learned this everywhere. But it took trial and difficulty. It took something embedded into my experience before I would change. God knows that we say we are Christians and we make up our minds to serve Christ. How long does it last? We don't even focus for more than a moment. God knows that in order to really change character, he has to bring us to a certain place and keep us there over an extended period of time. You know why I became a Christian? When I was 17, I, I, I started working, finished high school, started working. For five years, I lived the life that I, that I had always wanted to live. Left church, went out and became a wild young fellow. Had nothing to do with God. And when I recognized that, if there is a God, I'm heading for hell. I started to tell people, there's no God. I satisfied myself with that for five years. Until one day, I got into some trouble. Oh man, to this day, I don't tell anybody what it is. Because it was so, it was so shameful. But, it was so bad, I decided to kill myself. But I didn't have the courage. And for three days, this thing pressed on me, and I could not get away. I did not know what to do. For three days, I played with the idea of killing myself. And God allowed it to soak. Till it became so deeply ingrained into my experience that I would never forget. And on the third day, or after three days, I remember that when I was a boy, I learned a verse. All things work together for good to those who love God. I said, that's not for me. I don't love God. But God was talking to me. He was working with me. And I remember, I remember another verse that says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And I so badly wanted that. I was such a mess. I wanted somebody who knew what he was doing to take my life and do something with it. That's why I became a Christian. 
That's why I knelt down that day and I said, God, take my life. I don't know what I said. I knelt down in the room. I went into the room with a thousand pound weight on my head. When I got up off my knees, I was as light as a feather. I had never seen the grass so green. I had never seen the sky so blue. And for 33 years, it has not left me. Because God made it soak into me. Because God knows that trial and difficulty is the only way that characters are permanently changed. So what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, God has a washing machine. And he's planning to do some washing. And if you would like to be among the people who have perfect characters, who are going to be used to represent God in the world, God has family that he's going to use and say to the world, look at them, that's what my family is, that's what my kingdom stands for, look at them and he's going to say to, to, to Satan, do your best. And wait, when Satan has finished doing his best, God will say, here are they that keep the commandments of God. Because Satan will not be able to make them bend in the slightest degree. But you think they are going to come to that place in peace and safety? No, 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 no. no. Trial is the only thing that permanently changes character. I want you to look at Malachi chapter 3. And I'm going to close here. Where we see a description of what is going to happen. Malachi chapter 3. In verse 1 it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And I believe this is speaking of the coming of the prophet Elijah. I mean the, the spirit and power of Elijah. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And I believe this speaks of coming to the temple or coming to the sanctuary in the judgment process. In the judgment of the living. I won't dwell on that too much. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But look what it says now. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now, the fuller's soap was a special kind of soap that they used to wash clothes white. It says when Jesus comes to his temple, he's like a refiner's fire. And he's like the, the fuller's soap, the special washing soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. In other words, what it is saying is that Jesus is going to sit down like somebody who is a goldsmith or a silversmith and he's going to burn his people. Let me put it another way. He's going to pass his people through the fire. Now I'm afraid of the fire. Because I've had some hard times in my life. And when I think that this that is coming. is going to make that look like a baby's play thing. I'm scared. But I realize. That the person who controls the fire. Is my friend. And he's on my side. You know what happens to gold when you burn it? It runs like water for a while. But in this process of running like water, all that happens is that the impurities come to the top and you can skim them off. You know what happens to trash when you burn it? It becomes worse trash. What happens when you are put in the fire depends upon what you are. You don't need to be afraid of the fire. You need to be afraid of what you are when you are going into the fire. If you have the First name of God. Don't worry. You're going to come out. But if you don't have God's name or God's nature. If you are just going through the forms of Christianity. And you are put in the fire. You're going to come out as ashes. You have nothing to keep you in fire. That's the nature of fire. It purifies metal. But it destroys everything else. In the coming tribulation, God is going to not only purify the gold, but he's got, going to also demonstrate what is gold and what is trash. The Bible says it is Jesus who will do it. And so the one for the four thousand come out of it. And they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. Because in this process, they have not only 
They, they are now more than Christians who simply have the nature of God. But they have gone through an experience where for one day, two days, three days, five days, five months, maybe a year, they have lived in a situation where they could not forget Christ for one single moment. I know we try today, right? But Brother Abraham has to go and plant his potatoes. Sister Pat has to go to her job. We are distracted. But have you ever had a child who was dying? You ever had a child who was, who was dying? Had a disease? Have you ever forgotten that the child was dying? Your own child is dying. Have you ever forgotten that for one moment? If your child is dying, I bet you, you don't forget to pray 10 times, 20 times, constantly during the day. You're not going to forget. When something puts you in a situation and compels your mind to stay upon Christ, God is doing you a favor. And he's going to bring the remnant to this place through the great tribulation where they dare not let him go for one minute. They live by him, they eat by him, their jobs are gone, their homes are gone. Their very existence depends upon a constant maintaining of that relationship with him. When they come through it, I'll tell you, they, have lear they will have learned a lesson that will never be erased from them for all eternity. They will have passed through the experience like Jesus. They will be perfected in that experience of abiding. And so Jesus says, I will write upon them my new name. There is something in their character that is the same as Christ's experience when he passed through that last great crisis. They sing a song that nobody else can sing. They have an experience that only Jesus understands. They and he, the, the song of Moses and the Lamb, they sing the song and nobody else of all the millions who have lived on this earth and who will be saved, none of them can sing it. There's something that God has ahead of us, brothers and sisters. And it's frightening, but it's wonderful. The Advent movement was raised up to participate in this experience. But man, when you think of it and you get a glimpse of it and you think of what we are today, my Lord, how we have missed the mark. How we have missed the mark. And we have forgotten the purpose of even focusing on this character perfection. And we have taken away the assurance of salvation from our young people by telling them they have to be perfect before they can be saved. Perfect in surrender, but not perfect in character. No, that is reserved for the 144,000. Well, as I promised, I'm going to close on that note. And I hope that what I've said is understandable. And I hope it is something that not only reaches our head, but our hearts. Like me, I hope you have a desire to be among the 144,000. But know this, that if God chooses something else for you, another destiny, if you are in Christ, you are safe. Don't let anybody take this from you. God bless and thanks for your attentiveness. i
Father knows best, and I trust in His care. Through purging or fruit, I will bear. I rejoice in the Lord; He makes me. Oh, mm -hmm.